welcome Kate. Thank you. Well, I thought maybe people hadn't heard the Heart Before Live, so we should begin with We the should. <laughs> right, a quick introduction before we start chatting. First of all, hello to everybody here at Somerset by the Park in Flatbush. Nice to see you. Thank you for having us. And hello to all of you, wherever you are joining us. Now, we've um, done this interview with series all year. Uh, shout out to Kirsty, who has been sorting those. And now it's really exciting that we're actually with people. <laughs> Although I'm you know, still talking to you somewhere from, from a screen. So today we've got something a little bit different, which, as you have heard, is a, a bit of a performance as well as just a chat. So Kate Target Adams has travelled the world with her talents. She's a songwriter, she's a singer, and of course she's pretty good on the harp. <laughs> And, and uh, we, we get, get to talk to her good. for the best part of an hour. And remember, if you've got some questions, you're probably going to have to have them from the floor today, unless you can get through to somebody online and uh, they've got a mobile here and you can ask them. But I think we're just going to do the old-fashioned thing and have questions from the floor. Right, Kate. Hello, I, that <laughs> takes me right back, the, um, the harp. It's a beautiful instrument. But uh, can you quickly just tell us a little bit about the history mm. of it? Well, the harp is one of the most ancient instruments in the world. And it's depicted in the Bible quite a lot. Uh, King David is shown playing the harp. You'll see cherubs with harps. I'm hoping that after this, <laughs> I get a place in heaven. <laughs> but uh, yeah, even in Egyptian tombs, you will see a picture of an ancient harp. And in those days, I brought with me a special tool, which is my six-year-old son's bow. In those days, the harp resembled more like a bow. So people would play that and hear that it had a resonance, a vibration. And then as time went on, they added more strings, more and more and more strings. And most people might think now about the full-size orchestral harp. And yes, they're massive. Yes, they are big. Yeah. And they have a slightly different technique to my one, which is a Celtic harp. So I was born in Scotland, and this uh, is my trusty assistant. And the Celtic harp has 34 strings and levers. You'll see me changing key as I play. Right. Yeah. So this is the baby of this the is. harp family, is it? Yes, although I do have a smaller one. Oh. Um, it's called a harpsicle, and I, I wear it like a guitar, and I can walk around and serenade oh. you individually. <laughs> oh, I think that's a <laughs> yeah. option. Next we'll time. It. Next time, you have to come and do a little... In fact, if anyone's doing a proposal, you know, <laughs> on TikTok or something really modern, and you can have her doing this, you know, there you go. <laughs> So where did you start? You're Scot oh, plainly you're Scottish. Yes, yes. I, I don't sound Scottish. I, I, did, I did sound Scottish at the beginning, but some kind of birth defect in Edinburgh, <laughs> and I now sound pretty English. Um, but I've travelled the world, and I've lived in Hong Kong for 15 years before coming to New Zealand to live, so uh, I think my accent got a little diluted along the way. So you can still tell, though. You oh, can still okay, tell. good. Go. Especially after a whiskey. Yes. <laughs> well, I, I imagine you'd be quite particular about your whiskies if you're a Scottish less. Well, that was the training. I, I did play for a lot of distilleries, <laughs> and uh, yeah, basically part of the job was uh, sipping whiskey right. with the bagpipers and yeah, all the burnt suppers. Oh, yeah, I'm not much. complaining. No, it doesn't sound <laughs> bad. So when did you first pick up a harp or were there other instruments early on? Well, I really never thought I would have a career in music. I didn't show much musical prowess. I started to play the piano when I was six. And at seven, the piano teacher asked my mum to step aside after class and she said she should give up. Oh, really? I thought you said she was going to say, oh, she's brilliant. No, I'm afraid not. And so my mum was mildly offended, to say the least. But I would like to say to Mrs. Sinclair, thank you. So if I had continued slogging away at the piano with no raw talent, I would have had a, a quite a difficult experience, and I would probably have never found the Klarzach, the, the Scottish name for the Celtic harp. And ironically, if you lift the lid off a grand piano, the piano is almost like a yes. yeah, horizontal yeah. harp. It's actually a zither, zither family. So I think uh, my mum got the last laugh because I kind of ended up playing a a piano of sorts. Lovely. Mm. So did you do, what, regular classes? How does one find a um, right. harp teacher? Well, I was, as I was born in Edinburgh, there was an international harp festival just starting up. So I did a course when I was eight, course when I was nine, course when I was ten, and uh, my harp teacher, Isabel Miris, actually was awarded an MBE by Her Late Majesty the Queen for her services in reviving this instrument in Scotland. So after three years of courses, my parents thought I might be yeah, determined enough to take classes, 
um, but it was really more of a hobby, a party trick. My parents at that stage owned a boutique bed and breakfast in our Georgian house in Edinburgh, and I would be asked to come and play for the guests after their breakfast of bacon and haggis. Then they would sit on the stairs, I would sit in the corner, and I would perform for them. Oh. So that's really where I did my 10,000 hours, I guess. Good. Mm. And then uh, you must have gone off to school, you, not in yeah. Edinburgh, I understand. You're an Oxbridge girl, Oxford educated? Yes, mm. I, I read Spanish and German at university. I, I never, since I didn't have much musical talent, I didn't actually think to study music. And Oxford was quite intense. We were studying mm. a, you know, an oeuvre of an author a week in a foreign language, so I didn't have much time for harping on. Harping on. But... <laughs> uh, <laughs> but just to when I was studying my finals, actually, I received a call from the Scottish Tourist Board, and they said, would you go to Washington, D.C., represent Scotland? And I said, well, no, thank you, because I have my finals in four weeks' time, and I can't possibly go for four days to Washington. Then I remember very clearly, I went to the red telephone box outside the Bodleian Library, called up my mum, told her the story. What a shame. She said, you get back on that phone, <laughs> you call them up, you're going to Washington. So I did, and that actually changed, Change I guess, my, yeah, my life. Yeah, see, look, parents. Good. Yeah, thank goodness for moms yeah, and yeah, dads good. and dads. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, did I read something where your dad went to Cambridge? Yes, he did. Yes. So yes. was there any sort of like, oh, Oxford, Rivalry. Yes, the Oxford <laughs> Cambridge thing? No? Well, um, I, I was, my, my middle name is Emma because my dad went to Emmanuel College, and I did go to Cambridge, and I thought I'll follow in my father's footsteps, but uh, they wouldn't have me. Because oh. I was from Scotland, and at that stage they wanted A-levels, and I was doing Scottish hires mixed with A-levels, and a Hertford College where I did go at, at Oxford, much more liberal, open-minded, so I found a, a yeah, welcoming arms there. Right. Well, yeah. your father would have, you know, I'm sure, gone, yes, yeah. thank you, Oxford, <laughs> my talented daughter. Yeah. So what happened in, in Washington, D.C. that was so life-changing? Well, I think just because when I perform other people can then hear me, I'm like my own business card. So one job mm -hmm. led to another. Then I was starting to perform regularly for the Scottish Tourist Board, for the Scottish Government. I, would, I was very motivated, so I would accept every job. One time I went for Visit Scotland, the Scottish Tourist Board, to Canada overnight, got off the plane, played the gig, slept, got back on the plane, played the gig because I had another one back in Scotland. So I was performing quite, um, yeah, quite regularly. Mm. I was going to America for Tartan Week. That's where I performed for Sean Connery. Sean Connery? Um, yeah. Really? Oh. Yeah. Oh, they um, want to know about Sean oh, yeah. Connery. <laughs> well, he, so, okay, let's He has okay. a lovely, oh, he had a lovely handshake. It was just oh. like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> the ladies are all swooning yeah. now. And he was very, very tall. So I remember I was performing in the Waldorf Astoria. It was actually a fundraiser after 9-11. And mm. we were fundraising for the firemen and their families. And so I got in the lift. And then Sean Connery walked in. And, like, <laughs> and then, and literally, he was in his kilt, of course, you know. And then you, you just keep going up and up and up and up and up and up. <laughs> right. Yeah. Perfect. Very tall man. Yes, I can imagine you be like this. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So at this point, you're you're around the world. Where does China come into mm -hmm. this? Because right. I'm hearing you're going Scotland, US, yes. Canada. Well, it was a surprise to me as well. <laughs> uh, I was performing. In those days when I was building up my business after university, I was often performing in palaces, castles, ruins. There were no kind of bars and pubs for me. The harpist, you know, actually has quite an, um, a noble history. Mm. Normally clan chieftains would always have their own harper and they were normally male. That's the other interesting thing about the harp. It normally oh. was a male-led instrument. And they would sit up with the nobility on the clan chieftain's high table. They would even be consulted about going to war. They would play songs before, you know, battle commenced with Braveheart and everything. Good job. So, yeah, yeah, it was a big job. <laughs> um, so, so I started to, yes, perform in castles. And um, at Stirling Castle, I was performing a one-woman show. And the ambassador to the embassy in China uh, in London was in the audience. He wrote me an email, said, come to China. <laughs> yeah, uh, well. represent Scotland. I went with the Scottish Youth Bagpipe Band and um, it was a very surreal experience actually because that was 2004 and China has changed quite radically now. 
Uh, everything's beautiful, shiny buildings, um, not, not as wild. I feel I saw raw China, and raw China probably saw me. So the, the very first performance I had, they asked me, would you like to have your makeup done? So I said, well, that would be lovely. And it was only later I realized probably they hadn't much experience of a Western face. So looking at me back in the mirror was a character from Peking Opera. <laughs> <laughs> so thick white face coat, bright red cheeks, big eyebrows, bright red lips. There was no time to do anything about that. So I just started to tune up my harp. And um, I'll just show you what happens yes, when I tune yes. the harp. Because this is actually where the phrase harping on comes from. You are normally harping on a string. And Shakespeare uses this in his play, Richard III. So I keep playing the same string, which ends up having a nagging effect. So that's why harping on is, has come, come about as a phrase oh. in English language. But I was doing that for about eight minutes. And then I looked up and suddenly cameras, video cameras, everybody clapping, just because I had chewed my heart. <laughs> and then I went on stage, and it was actually a stadium of 10,000 people. Yeah, and they had signs, we love you, we love you. They were chanting. So I looked behind us, like, maybe the remaining members of the Beatles have just walked onto the stage. But no, this is for me. So. I, my eyes adjusted to the light, and actually, all around the stadium were soldiers standing there. Yeah, it was a really big reminder of where I was. And one other reminder was there's a, a strong emphasis on presentation in China. So I started to sing. We'd already done the sound check, but as I started to sing, a bubble machine starts blowing. So it looks beautiful, right? Bubbles are all the way through the air, but I'm opening my mouth to sing. I'm swallowing bubbles. I keep the show must go on. So it, it was uh, quite a different experience, mm. yes. Well, would, would we like to hear something that um, you would have played in China, I reckon? Mm. Because presumably yeah. you also speak Mandarin. Yes, yes, yes. Multilingual. <laughs> well, I didn't used to speak Chinese. Um, the second year, because that festival in Nanning went well, the ambassador asked me to go back to Shanghai and headline a festival there the next year in 2005. And he said, learn these songs. So I, I learned the songs, but I didn't know what I was really singing about. There was a line that went, um, which means gently, gently, the feelings rise out of my heart. But I was gently, gently washing carts. That's how I learned it. But I've, I've come on a bit since then. But I'd like to maybe play for you the very first song I ever learned in Chinese. It's a beautiful love song. It's called Just Like Your Tenderness, and it describes when you've moved on from a relationship and you think back on those feelings and the tenderness that you had. And I'll just introduce it for you in Mandarin.
I didn't, no. no. I made a mistake. I studied Spanish and German instead. Oh, that's <laughs> right. So you learned Spanish and German, and obviously English is your mother tongue, and then you just picked up Mandarin. Well, I think it is easier if you have a base knowledge of other languages. Also, I have um, my, my grandmother on my father's side, my, my father's mother was um, from South America. So I think I have uh, an appreciation of language. I mm. like different languages. And I actually find it fascinating learning Mandarin. It helped me really understand the culture. For example, it's a, they're very mathematical in China, amazing. And lots of the language is mathematical too. So days of the week are, uh, you know, day one, day two, day three, day four. Months are in, oh. are in one, two, three, four. So um, I could really understand more about the language and the culture, the mindset through learning Mandarin. So I enjoyed that aspect. So you're living in Hong Kong at this point? Yes, I moved and to how, how long did you live there and perform? I lived there for about uh, 13 years, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. And that was great because it was like China for beginners. You know, it was very easy to start a business, easy to make friends. Because of the size of the apartments, they're so small, everybody socialises on the street. And of course, compared to Scotland, there was loads of sunshine. <laughs> so once I landed there, I was like, okay, this is the place for me. And because of Hong Kong's British heritage, it was quite easy. I started sending out press packs to the British Embassy. I started playing for the royal family when they came over. Oh, yeah. stop. Tell us more. <laughs> we want the stories, don't we? <laughs> yes, yes. We want all of the little back-end stories. Well, I guess I was a solution for East meets West at that time. So I used to sing the Chinese anthem in Mandarin, the, the, the God Save the Queen. I've never sung yet God Save the King. Um, so I was always singing the anthems at the uh, official engagements that they would do. So I was lucky to meet quite a few of the royal family. And yeah, it was a really special, special experience. And um, back to, you know, that history of the harp, there always used to be a royal harpist. So up until 1871, um, Queen Victoria had uh, a, a man at that point. And in 2000, Prince Charles actually reinstated the tradition of having a royal harpist. Yeah. Now, as a Princess Trust ambassador, I wrote to him and I, I put myself forward, but turns out you have to be born Welsh. <laughs> ah, <laughs> right. Yeah. Okay. Darn. I read somewhere that he's got a bagpiper that wakes him up every morning. That's Is that right? True. Apparently. I think that's right. Isn't there? Someone under the window has mm -hmm. the bagpipe. I can think of better instruments to wake up to. Well, I would have thought. I think a, a bagpipe can definitely wake you up. <laughs> a harpist is said to be given three special skills, which is that you can make your audience laugh, cry, or sleep. Right. So I, I can't do the morning slots. No, no, you cannot. So um, while we're talking about uh, famous people, who else have you performed for? Not necessarily or in Asia and around the globe? Um, well, I remember performing for J.K. Rowling. That was quite an experience because Edinburgh Castle was being transformed into Hogwarts. Uh, for a oh. massive opening for Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince. Which is about book number 653? No, it was about <laughs> seven or eight in the series. It's quite late in the series, but yeah. Mm. And they yeah. did this really amazing thing where Edinburgh Castle was, was taken over and a lot of underprivileged children came and J.K. Rowling was reading, on the stroke of midnight, she was reading an excerpt from the book. So it was in the Great Hall at Edinburgh Castle and wow. I was set up, I was performing just before she read and just after she read but at about three minutes to midnight, they said, all the adults have to leave. So I, I'm oh. playing, I was like, oh, oh. Is, does that mean me? <laughs> but I just kept on playing. I was wearing this big velvet cloak, and uh, so I got to hear J.K. Rowling read, and none of the children noticed, and so I can confirm that the Harry Potter invisibility cloak really does work. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, well, I'm sure you're part of the crew, you know, part of the furniture. Maybe, yeah. Maybe the Harpers harpers get special yeah. access yes, backstage absolutely. pass. So, uh, at the Royals, you've, you've, you've performed mm, for? Yes, yeah. and uh, well, I performed at the opening of the Scottish Parliament when the, the Her Majesty the Queen attended. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, lots of um, Royals come, came to visit Hong Kong, were in China. Uh, quite a few presidents and President of Ireland, uh, Prime Minister of Great Britain and Scotland the Vice Premier of China. Uh, mm. Yeah, that was interesting because this, she's the most senior lady in the Chinese government. Mm. And I actually performed for her back in Edinburgh and she was receiving an honorary doctorate. Right. So uh, I performed, it was very nerve wracking because everybody was very tense because she was such a high level mm. diplomat and uh, official. And so I performed my song and then everybody 
went quiet. And then she stood up and she started clapping. And then everybody oh. else clapped. And went, <laughs> 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 OK. So, yeah. Good. That's Bit that's of solidarity from the women folk. Yes. yes. Uh, in China, you also did some etiquette uh, work, which is a thing, apparently. You know, you can teach etiquette. Tell us yes, about that. Well, again, I don't really know what I'm doing in my life. I just see the opportunity. Somebody asks me to do something. I say yes, panic later, and then somehow <laughs> manage to make it work, I hope. But uh, I started to notice in Hong Kong, everybody's body language was quite shy, especially women. Uh, eye contact wasn't made, facial expressions, vocal presence. And I have had to develop some of these skills myself by being on a stage, sometimes with thousands of people, and just me and my heart. So sometimes, yeah, you have to fake it till you make it. So I created a course that would help people improve their posture, their body language, their presence. And I was performing in Shanghai, and the TV producer for the Miss Universe China show was there. She said, come and play the harp, show the girls what, you know, how to learn a skill. And I told her about my company teaching people basically to teaching people to have more confidence in themselves. And she was like, forget the harp. Come and teach them you know, what you know about personal branding. And uh, it was a lovely experience because I was a little skeptical, Miss Universe, you know, a little skeptical. But the, the girls were so eager to learn. They saw this as an opportunity, a way out of uh, their, you know, maybe life in the country in China in some cases. And they worked so hard. They were hungry for knowledge. And it was just a really beautiful experience. Mm. So I kept getting asked back more year on year. And then they were like, well, can you, you're British. Can you teach etiquette? And I was like, <laughs> yes, I can. <laughs> <laughs> and then I, I studied with the English Manor, which is an etiquette company in London. And I went back and taught etiquette. And you know, we were teaching things that are quite low level. I asked on one time on the TV show, I said, everybody put your knife and fork together how you think it should be. Mm -hmm. And nobody puts their knife and fork together as we would in British culture. Um, of course, Americans and French have their own system, but British is probably the best. Yes, um, that'll be the gold standard, I'm yeah, yeah. yeah. um, And I get it, because you know, how would we know which chopsticks to use at a formal banquet? You know, there are two sets of chopsticks. Do you know why? No. no. So the one set is for taking the food, the communal food, and putting it on your plate but you would never want to put those chopsticks in your mouth. So for hygiene purposes, oh. those are only used for the communal plates on the Lazy Susan. And then you've got your own pair of chopsticks for eating yourself. I've never thought about that. That's so sensible, isn't mm. it? Very sensible. Mm. Yeah, so there were, there were so many experiences in China that I found bewildering. And yet, uh, it was such a wonderful experience. That led me to actually teach hundreds of hotel staff across Hong Kong, Macau, China, in etiquette, presentation skills. Yeah, and I, I never thought I would be doing any of that. <laughs> um, there you go, you just follow what happens next yes. and create the opportunities as they come. Yes. Or you take the opportunities. Yes. So then at what, what, what point do you leave China? When, when does that, I mean, I'm sorry, Hong Kong. Yeah. Well, I came for a three week holiday to Queenstown in March 2020 and I still haven't been back home. <laughs> so this is home. Well, this became home. This the rest is, is COVID home. history. Yeah. Um, just recently, Hong Kong has changed its quarantine rules. So I will go back in January for a, a short trip. Uh, however, yes, New Zealand became my home thanks to COVID. And it was quite a welcome change of pace at first. You know, sometimes I was ricocheting from high pressure performance to high pressure performance. Suddenly, uh, I was just surrounded by beautiful mountains and lakes, and I was in the Celtic heartland of New mm. Zealand. Yeah. And so uh, I enjoyed that change of pace. I didn't stay quiet for long. I started a TikTok channel with my three-year-old son, and we started to, to record all the British nursery rhymes. So row, row, row your boat, doe a deer, uh, hey diddle diddle. We did them all, and within a few months, we had 120,000 followers in China. So, yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, but we never let on it was New Zealand, actually. Everybody kept on posting, where's this mythical heavenly land? And my Chinese business partners said, shh. Mm. So they knew it wasn't Scotland because it was far too sunny. But uh, the secret is 
still, still there. Yeah, yeah, still kept safe. And so what do we keep um, feeding onto the TikTok channel with a now, what, six-year-old? Anything? Or? Yeah, no, he's re he doesn't like to perform anymore with no. me. No. So uh, we actually paused that TikTok channel um, because, interestingly, TikTok has developed. It's for mm. quick fixes. It's not so much for learning. Um, but now I've actually moved into a slightly different business in China, creating names, English names. So Creating English well, names. Let's say right. some of the Miss Universe China girls were called IC. For example, there was an IC. And I said to her, I don't think you can win Miss Universe if you're called IC. So would you allow me to suggest a name that might suit you better? She had beautiful long hair, very elegant, and we suggested Chloe. So she rebranded herself as Chloe. And uh, as we went on, then we had more and more girls, name me, name me. And it's, it's very understandable. I mean, how would we know what we should be called in Chinese? And in actual mm. fact, Chinese has a much better system because they, they pick elements of like, you know, what, what the child wants to be. It's quite... Oh, how beautiful. Yes, it, it, mm. there's a real art to picking a Chinese name. Whereas we're like Simon, Kate, Bob. Mm. So how can we all be the same, you know? Mm. So I, I understood that in China they don't have the same sensitivity. Why would they for, for picking their English names? So you do get a lot of Wincy, Vincy's, um, Queenie's, um, your Victor, some quite old-fashioned yes. male names. Yeah. So um, together with my mum, actually, she became the face of that business because they wanted somebody who had a, a plethora of experience and sophistication. And so, yeah, so we've got a naming business in China and that's keeping us busy. <laughs> Fascinating. <laughs> and what do you do? Do you like get a picture of someone and go, I think that looks like a Sarah? <laughs> no, that's uh, Chloe. <laughs> I did in the early days, <laughs> but, now, but now, now it's an app. It's an app. Right, okay. And so people can go on, they choose their preferences, um, what they want for themselves, what represents them, what style of name. Mm. And then I we get all the data and then choose, you know, give them a couple of choices and the meaning behind that. Yeah, and sometimes it sounds like their Chinese name. For example, my Chinese name is Kai Tu. And the meaning oh. that I was that given, it means like winner, special winner, which is, I'll take that, thank yeah. you very much. Very good, <laughs> very good, very good. Okay. Um, ooh, we've got about half an hour left, but we do want to get a lot of music in rather than me just harping on. Um, <laughs> different styles of music on this beautiful instrument. Yeah, I like to show that you can play more than just the ethereal classical yeah. potential music that people think about on the harp. Would you like to hear yes, something we would, jazzy? We? Yes, okay. something jazzy as us. Yeah. And I might make you sing along a little bit later on. Oh, yeah. And you at home or in the other Somerset villages. So feel free to, to sing along at any point. You'll know this one. It's called Fly Me to the Moon. Oh, thank you. Hmm. Fly me to the moon and let me play among the stars. Let me see what spring is like on Jupiter. Beautiful. We want more, don't we, really? Yeah. Yes, we definitely want more. Well, I'll only say some more if you join me on the next song. Can yeah. we strike a deal? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah.
Maybe I'll play you a, a very Scottish song. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Who's from Scotland or Scottish? Oh, aye, Scottish aye. Aye. Yes. <laughs> welcome, welcome. So this has actually got a very interesting story behind it. It's called The Bonnie Bonnie Banks of Loch Lomond. Oh, oh they know it. Okay, <laughs> here we go. Uh, but not so many people know the story. Mm. So it takes place when the 1745 Jacobite uprising had failed. All the Scottish soldiers were stuck in England. Are there any English in the audience? Oh, yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. So the Scottish soldiers were stuck in England. The English said the Scots could go into exile, at least be free from England, as long as one soldier died for his country as a martyr. They had to pick straws. And the one who picked the shortest straw sings the song. He sings, yield, tack the high road, because you will all be crossing the land into freedom. But I'll tack the low road, because I will be taking the low road of death. But I'll be in Scotland afore ye, because the minute the soldier dies, his heart is reunited with Scotland. So, thank you that they're ready. <laughs> people on tour with you, you know, Kate. Fantastic. <laughs> Somerset on tour. That's Somerset the next thing. on tour. There's an idea, Kirsty. That's what we're going to take around the country. You like the idea. Here we go. Watch out. You'll be auditioned. <laughs> Just have a seat for, 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 for um, a little time because we're, we've only got 20 minutes and I do know that we want to ask some questions and I also want to do some Christmas stuff with you. D should we start? Just first of all, are there any particular questions here that you'd like to ask? Kate, I am your voice because... Yes, I'd like to say to you, first of all, she's a beautiful looking girl. She is, it's a, yes, she's a beautiful looking girl. Still. Now, that half is one of the smaller ones, and when you get the big one, yes. do you have a servant to carry <laughs> or do you carry them all yourself? Now, now, just before you answer this, because I've got a microphone on, and what's your name? 
I'm sorry, it's Val. Val. Val yes. hasn't got a microphone on. So I'm just going to relay this for those of you around the country. So this is the small harp, but uh, Val's saying, what happens with the big harp? Do you have a servant? <coughs> yeah. That would be nice. <laughs> Good idea. <laughs> um, it's a great question. So I feel like I'm like a modern day traveling minstrel. This yeah. one, yeah, I, I stick in the back of the car. I can travel around. But that's why... The harp actually then developed in 1697, a Bavarian harp maker developed pedals which uh, changed the key. So this one can't play exactly chromatically. This one, um, for example, I'll just go into a little bit of harp history here. Um, if I put the levers on, I play a scale and the C's are the red strings, the black's the F, so it's like painting by numbers and you just got to guess the strings in between. <laughs> But what happens is with the pedals, they change all the C's at the same time, all the F's at the same time. So that allowed a harp to be in an orchestra because suddenly it could play classical music. So it's actually, the, the full-size harps are actually more for the orchestra. So I don't actually ever try to take that around the country. Yeah, because if uh, you move a full-size harp, it can go out of tune instantly. So it's actually, that's really why you might see those ones. Traditionally in the 19th, 20th century, they were in drawing rooms and they became a very feminine instrument because they can't be moved. Mm. My theory is they used to be a male-led instrument because you had to carry it around the country without it, any, you know, transport. So you had to be pretty strong. But these days I work out, so I can, I can carry this. <laughs> I'm not being a hard word, as you say, it's, it's for an orchestra. Yes. Mm. But that has got this beautiful sound with it. Oh, thank mm. you. I mean, the Scottish sound came through straight away when you first <laughs> uh, played it. Oh, lovely. <laughs> thank yes. you, Val. So Val is yes. sold on the smaller version mm. of, the, of the orchestral harp, as yes. you are, yes. no doubt. Yes, yes, yes I am. Uh, yeah. Any other questions from the floor before we get into some festive singing, uh, of which you're also going to be part of, by the way? Any more questions from Kate, or for Kate, rather? Yes, one here. Hi, um, my name's Kate, and your fingers, do they, ah. you must have hardened them up to. Yeah. <laughs> so, so Kate's asking about uh, whether your fingers have to be hardened up uh, for the job. Well, the word harp actually comes from the Anglo-Saxon and Old German meaning to pluck. So in traditional times, they actually played the harp with steel strings and their fingernails. And oh. the harp that's now in South America, the men still play with their fingernails. However, the they men have long fingernails then. Yeah, they do. Right, okay. Mm -hmm. However, when the Celtic harp with the levers came about, people started to play with yeah, the pads of their fingers. So um, I'll just show you again. On the harp, I use my right hand is normally, this is middle C. My right hand is for above middle C and the left hand is for the lower strings. So traditionally these were made of catgut, they're now made of nylon, and these were always steel strings. So you're right, Kay, that my, this finger is the one that plucks the strongest, and this one, after a time of not practicing and then you go into heavy practice, this can be a little sore. But I often do get people coming and feeling my fingers after performances, and they go, oh, they feel like hands that do dishes with fairy liquid, they're soft. <laughs> so it's not too bad. Oh, you're such a talented person, so many wonderful stories. So before we start doing some Christmas carols, because, well, it's almost December, uh, any more questions from the floor, people? Uh, just, uh, is the Celtic harp the same as the Welsh harp? Is the Celtic harp the same as the Welsh harp? Well, that's a really good question. The Welsh harp is actually called a telin, which means triple strung harp. So they actually have two, in order to play grammatically, they have two rows of strings and then a third row of strings in the middle so that they can reach through and play. I mean, that sounds mind boggling to me. Mm. So this is the same as the Irish harp. Yes, so they are slightly different. So it's a really good question. But the, the, the Celtic harp has been a symbol uh, for many, many years. I mean, obviously you'll see that on Guinness cans, you'll see it on mm. Irish coins. 
And uh, yes, it's quite a, a strong emblem on still a lot of Celtic culture, football teams, things right. like that. Can we ask a personal one? We say, is your partner Chinese? Uh -huh. ah. is, the <laughs> is the father of your son Chinese? Uh, no. <laughs> oh, right. He is a no. Kiwi. Kiwi. <laughs> that's why she's here. Yes, ah. yes, <laughs> yes. So that's actually, um, so my then husband moved, well, he, he actually moved back to Hong Kong. Yeah. But um, actually, he has a house in Lake Hayes, near Queenstown. So it was just a holiday that I was coming out for. Three weeks holiday, turned into three years now. <laughs> yes, and my son has spent half his life here. Cameron's oh. now six. So yes, he's, he's um, confused. I think he thinks he's Hong Kong niece yeah. and also a Kiwi. So who knows what his accent's going to sound like. Oh. Good Scottish name, Thank isn't it, you. Cameron? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Any more? Questions? Of course, we can all have a cup of tea and, uh, you know. Yes, I'd love to chat afterwards. to those who are here, uh, love to chat to you afterwards. And, and love to encourage you to come and play the yes. harp. You cannot make a nasty sound. All you need to do is oh. just run your finger up yeah, and down yeah. it. And, and the good vibrations, it's thought this is a sound, uh, empty sound box. So it's thought that when you lean the harp against you, the, the vibrations are often quite healing. And yeah, very good for your body and soul. So please do come and be a harpist for a day or harper right. if you, the gentleman feel that's more appropriate. Well, I think it's definitely been very good for your body and soul, Kate. <laughs> right, so we're now going to uh, do the interactive part now. We've yes. got some Christmas carols, haven't we? Do you want to start with a medley to warm us up, Pat? Yeah, let's and get then, ourselves and then, in the festive then spirit. Then you can have a little think about uh, going me, 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 and ready to join. <laughs> I won't join, don't worry. <laughs> you till 2023 again let's do a verse of we wish you a merry christmas and then a verse of old lang syne so we can do them all together and if you don't know the words there's always the international song language of la 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 <laughs>
Right, um, before we sign off, we've got three of these to give away. And uh, should we do a little bit of a uh, test to see who's been listening, maybe? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, what will our, could our first question be? Does anyone how know? How many strings on the Celtic How many strings on the Celtic cup? That's guess? pretty tricky. I don't know if I said. I don't think you said, but you, you know. Yeah, quick count. <laughs> Did you tell us? No, I don't think she told us. I think this is a trick question. Now we need someone to count oh, quickly. What was that? <gasps> How do you know that? Really? Congratulations. 34. Oh, oh she's off. 34, I believe, is the answer. Guess. And this is K. So K, isn't it? Excuse me while I croak. 34. 34. And on a full size heart, there's 47. So they've got a, a broader. Right. Border range. Okay. Yes. Um, oh, well, I'm going to do an easy question now. Well, maybe if you're listening towards the end, what is the name of Kate's son? It's a Scottish oh, one. Yeah. Cameron! Oh. oh! Hi, Cam! Okay. <laughs> so, um, will you just have to pick somebody to give that to? Oh, over to you. I'll make you feel like the bad policeman. Because <laughs> I'd, I'd give them away to everybody. Um. <laughs> Okay, no. does any, has anybody else want to play your heart? No, I think that should... Oh, and also I was going to say a Scottish question. Mm. That was a Scottish question. This gentleman is Scottish. And you're not, you've got a Scottish background, sir? Yeah. Yes? That's yours there, I reckon. All right. There we go. Cameron was the Scottish name, and that chap was the first to put his name up. Lovely Hand to up. meet you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, and our last one. Our last... There's two CDs here. Yeah, I just bundled two together. Nice. It's Christmas. Anyway, if you don't have a CD player, just use it as a coaster. <laughs> <laughs> Doubles up. Um, right, what's the last question? Oh, it's going to have to be sort of not too easy and not too hard. Well, what about you? Well, what about me? What yeah. a question about me. Oh. Yeah, let's see if they know. How much do they know? How much do you know about me? Oh, no. Um, I'm having a birthday next week. How old do you think I am? Now, that's not a good question, is it? <laughs> It starts with a five. There's a, c a clue. Oh, oh no, this he gets it. He yes. gets it. There you go. You said I was 21. I'm just moving Don't for a minute. Go. Hang on. I'm 21. Oh, good man. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. True gentleman. Oh, very good. Actually, I'm 50, 55, about to turn 56. There we go. You did not look it. You did not look it. Oh, now a little bit about me for Christmas. Of my, of my oldest one, Ella was born in 1995, and she yeah. now lives in New York. And then uh, number two son is actually over there too, so they're flatting together, not arguing, so that's good. Uh, he's 24 today. His birthday is today, Jack. Happy Aww. birthday to Jack. <laughs> so this time, 24 years ago, I was, oh no, I wasn't huffing and puffing. I was, I was exhausted and done the job. And had the baby. <laughs> And our little one, yes, and the little one, our little one is now 19, Rosie, so, oh, yeah. Sweet. And I lose her next year to go off to the States with the others oh, on University sweet. Exchange, so we'll be empty nesters. I will have to speak to my husband. <laughs> Look at him go, oh, that's right, I remember you. <laughs> oh, he does do duck shooting. This woman knows too much about me. <laughs> yes, and I still refuse to cook the ducks, actually. They come home and they go in the freezer and I say, well, that's for you to cook. At least they're plucked. They have to come home looking like something from the supermarket, not like a duck. No. Right, and that's probably far too much information <laughs> right now. <laughs> but we can continue the chat about my children and the duck shooting husband. Uh, thank you very much, Kate, for, for being you. here. You are a big round of applause for Kate. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, just a little sign off from me, um, I, I, um, I love the Somerset crowd, I lost my parents, I've all retrofitted all of you to, um, to be like my parents, uh, um, I, love, I love talking to you all every couple of weeks, be it for an interview or for a quiz, join me for the quiz, I'm usually the dumbest one in the quiz, but I always learn something, so uh, thank you all for having me as part of your life and I wish you all a really lovely Christmas with the ones that you love, and um, we'll see you all again next year. Farewell. Yeah. Very fair.